Hello, Brother Sewing and Crafting family. I'm Brother Brand Ambassador Angela Wolf, and we are at your side virtually. Say hi, say where you're from, and if you're in my neck of the woods, you had to pull those sweaters out of the closet this morning. What a difference than Sunday. <laughs> so I see you all rolling in already. Hello, hello, and guess what? We have a fabulous show for you today. It's kind of a really good theme, I think. Tina must have known the weather was going to change. <laughs> we have a fall-themed project for you. Tina's joining us, and I can see you all. Looks like you can hear me. Hi, Arlene. Hi, Emily. Let's bring Tina to the party. Brother educator, Tina, how are you? I am doing great, and I had to get on my sweater this morning, too. It's not even 60 degrees in Tennessee. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it is cold, and I think that well, your project is going to be fabulous. It's right on target. You must make, is it your fault we got this weather, or <laughs> you just had a preparation? <laughs> All right, so so um, today I'm going to do a fall themed, either a wall banner or a mini quilt. And funny story, um, I started off thinking I was doing going to do a placemat, but I had so much fun making my quilt blocks on the scan and cut, it kept growing. Then I went to the quilt store, and they had this adorable little hanger. And so then that became the inspiration for the rest of my project. And so this is what we're going to walk through today. Whoops. Oh, I, I love that. Isn't that cute? Oh my gosh, that's adorable. So that started as <laughs> this big and it just kept growing. <laughs> I mean, I started cutting out those maple leaf blocks on the scan and cut and chain piecing them together. And I had so much fun that I just kept going and going. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cute. So be careful when you walk past the hangers. You might have to do a project for them. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an awesome project. So are you going to be using, um, what machines are you going to be using, just so people know? Yeah, so I have the Scan and Cut 230DX, and I have the uh, Luminaire that we'll be using today. Okay, awesome. Everybody's saying, adorable. I agree, adorable. All right, so should we get started? Let's get started. And if you've never been here before, this is how this works. We are streaming live on the Brothers Sewing and Crafting Facebook and YouTube page. So if you want to watch this again, you can always share this to your Facebook page or on YouTube. Be sure you can save it. You can subscribe to Brother. You won't miss it. You can go back and binge watch and ask your questions because we'll keep taking breaks and help you out. So, all right, Tina, I can't wait to see this. All right, perfect. So we're going to start off at the scan and cut. And went to sleep on me. Here we go. So in case you didn't know, one of the awesome features on the Scan and Cut is that we have uh, lots and lots of quilt blocks that are on the machine. And so we're going to go ahead and look at those. So we're going to go into the patterns. And if you scroll down to this next page, here's our quilt blocks. And you've got all kinds of different categories. Just so many beautiful quilt blocks that are in here. Um, we're actually going to use the maple leaf one today. So it's in this first category. And I'm just going to page down. But look how cute the spools, so many cute quilt blocks that are in here. But here's our maple leaf pattern, and I thought that would be perfect for fall, so we'll just pull that up. And it's gonna come in at a default size. You can see here it's a nine inch block. I actually, because my hanger's right around 12 and a half inches wide, I needed to resize mine down to six inch blocks. So that's really easy to do. I'm just gonna come in here, and I'll just keep going until it lands at six inches even. And for those of you who have made a lot of quilt blocks, what's really um, great about the Scan and Cut is when I cut it, it's automatically going to add a quarter inch seam allowance to all the pieces. So I don't have any of that complicated math that I have to worry about doing. So once I have it to the size I want, I'll hit OK. And here it's showing me all the pieces that I'll need to cut for each block. And you'll notice this block is in two different colors. I'm going to actually, uh, for my project, I made eight blocks. And where it's green here, four of them were a gold and four of them um, were an orange. The one I held up had two different colors of green. So you can kind of match whatever color scheme that you want. But when it's time to cut out the pieces, let's say I'm going to do the colored pieces for a block. I'll, I'll click on the piece here and I'll hit OK. And it'll tell me the size. And you'll see here you've got two lines. The inside line is where we'll actually stitch. And the outside line includes that quarter inch seam allowance. And it's letting me know that for each block, I'd have three of the squares. And so if I'm making one block, I'll go ahead and hit set. And you'll see it shows it to me on my mat here. Now I've got a half, I've got a fabric that covers half of my mat now. And so what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna go ahead and scan my mat. So I just hit the scan icon and then I'll hit start. And it's gonna take a picture of my mat so that I can make sure that all the pieces actually land right on top of my fabric, which I love that because for scrap buster projects and other things, I know exactly 
uh, where to put my pieces. I don't have any fabric waste when I'm doing this. Well, and also, yeah, I was going to say you could, you don't have so much waste and you could use little pieces too. Yeah, it's a great way to use up small pieces. So as you can see here, my pieces are right off the edge. So I'm just going to take the stylus and move them. So they're on my piece of fabric all the way. Whoops, move them a little bit more. Don't do it on camera. It makes, I'm, I'm not nervous when I'm doing it just by myself. <laughs> all right, so I've got plenty of room on here. So I'm going to go to the add button. And now I can come in and pick up some of the other pieces. So we can pick the triangle. It looks like I'll need four of those for the block. And it's giving me, again, the sizes here. And, it, you know, again, this is for one block. I would need four pieces. If I were going to make uh, three blocks, for example, I would multiply four by three. So I would be cutting out 12 of them. So that's the only math that we have to do here. So I'll set those in here. And you can see those are fitting here on my fabric as well. I still have some room. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up that last piece here. And again, same kind of information is available. And there it shows up on my mat. Now at this point, if you know, if you might have a lot of different pieces and you're really trying to get as much on the mat as possible, you can use this icon. And it, the, this gives you choices for how to basically lay out the pieces on your mat. I'm gonna pick the first one here, which is kind of random. And it's gonna reset the pieces so they take up the least amount of fabric. So that's another great tip if you really are trying to maximize um, the use of your fabric with the scan and cut okay so don't forget that you do have the option to rearrange you can see here it's you know it's a more of a linear relationship in here everything's facing the same way if you had a directional print or something like that but i'm going to go ahead and use random because mine's all right so at this point i'm let's say this is what i'm going to cut um, i would hit okay and now i would choose an action so i just want it for a second um, talk about, you know, not everyone is really comfortable sewing quarter inch seams. And so you do have multiple actions that you can select here. If I wanted to draw the uh, seam lines on the fabric before I cut it, I could just come in here and select the draw. And then the first time it passed through, it would draw the pieces on the fabric. When that was done, I would come back in and do the cut action separate set as the second action, and then it would cut around the pieces. So it's really quick and easy to do it. And I, as a matter of fact, I've already cut the pieces out. So let's come over here and look at what it looks like when it's cut. So here, here are my pieces. Now notice here, um, I went ahead and I used my fabric mat and the thin fabric blades. So let me move the mat so you can see the color really quickly here. So this is the one with the gold bottom on it. Oops, there it is. So I've got my fabric mat. And when I was at the machine, the cutter, I was using the thin fabric auto blade. So that also has that matching gold tone here at the top. Um, and I... So I know you guys know we have a new rotary blade. I tested that out. That worked really nicely as well. I went ahead and cut them out on here because I had already starched all my fabrics before I got my rotary blade. I did that because I didn't want any stretch across the bias when I was stitching them. And so it was just faster for me to go ahead and use my fabric blade. Once they're cut, you can see here the lines that I've marked on there for where I would seam. And I used a heat erasable pen. So once I'm done sewing and I iron it, those lines, of course, will disappear. And then all I have to do to construct my blocks is just lift my fabric pieces off the mat. Pretty easy, right? Very so, easy. Very easy. Hey, Tina, someone just want, as, had a quick question. What, what fabric are you using? Is that cotton? Uh, this is actually a cotton batik. And then the, uh, the other fabrics that I used, I had two cottons. And then I had one that has a little rayon blend in it, and they all cut really well with us. Perfect. Thanks. Uh -huh. No problem whatsoever. Um, one tip for you guys. I know sometimes, like my fabric mat, I've used it a bunch, so I've been cutting a lot of things with it. When you first start using it and it's super, super tacky, sometimes when you're removing the fabric, it's a little hard to lift it off the mat. You might get some fraying along the edges. And then when you pull it off the mat, it's kind of curved or distorted. And so um, if you end up in that situation, a really easy tip is to basically turn your mat upside down. And instead of peeling the fabric off the mat, peel the mat off the piece of fabric. And that'll minimize any of that um, edge disruption and make sure that your pieces are really flat as they come off the mat. Oh, that's a really good tip, by the way. Uh, that is it. it no matter what you teach rest day, that was an excellent tip because I have that problem. <laughs>
Well, good. I'm glad. And so basically to cut all eight of the blocks, you end up with a whole bunch of perfect pieces like this. Um, I think I had a mat and a half of each of the dark colors and two and a half mats of my white background to cut it out. Honestly, I got all the pieces cut out and the fabric starched and pre-treated in less than an hour. So it was really, really quick to get everything cut out. So now that we have them cut, we're going to pop over to the luminaire and we're going to look at putting the blocks together. So um, I'm in the sewing side of the machine. So um, and all I need is a is a straight stitch. Right. So you have two choices on the utility side. You can choose the center stitch. And I've actually gone into the quilting um, category and used the stitch Q01, which is just going to be right down the center. Now, this shows the J foot. I actually have the quarter inch foot on the machine. And I do that because it makes it really easy for me to get that perfect quarter inch seam. So we're just going to, I'm going to show you really quickly a little bit of chain piecing. I've already started with some of the pieces. So we're just going to, whoops, keep going here. And then as that one finishes, I've already lined up the next two, the squares, and I'm just going to set them next to the foot, just like this. And it's going to pick it up and feed it in. And I, I don't really have to do anything. And at the end, I'm guaranteed a perfect quarter inch seam. So it's a really simple, easy uh, process to chain piece all the all the individual parts together. Once you get everything chain pieced, what you'll do is cut them apart. And then at the pressing station, you'll open them up and give them a quick press just like this. And then you're ready to take the block construction to that next phase. So really quick and easy to put all the pieces together. So let's come over back to the camera and let me just show you. Uh, some of the block construction here. All right, have it. So I will tell you another tip um, that was really useful for me is I don't know how many of you have made these maple leaf blocks before, but I'm telling you, I sewed so many of the pieces together in the wrong direction <laughs> when I first started. So I finally said, you know, this is silly. I should just get a picture of the block and put it here on my on my table so I have a reference when I'm putting all the pieces together, right? So uh, here's my reference piece. So again, for this first column, I guess here, these would be my pieces, right? And already you can see, actually this is for another section over there. All right, so this is what I don't wanna do is I don't wanna have all these little pieces in wrong and it's easy to do with the triangles, right? Like you might at the sewing machine think that looks good, but that's not how it looks in the picture. Not a problem. You're just gonna rotate your block around till it matches your picture. And then you'll basically join these together, right sides together. And again, you'll chain piece them at the machine with that quarter inch foot and you'll have, you'll have that row done. Same thing for the other sections. So here's the middle one. So it's got two blocks. Those are already been chain pieced together. And now I have to add the triangle. Well, you know, I might at the sewing machine think it goes this way, but if I'm looking at my picture, I'll just go ahead and orient that in so I get it in the right direction. And again, right sides together, take it back to the machine, stitch those together with a quarter inch seam. And then the last one, and really this was my, this is the piece that I <laughs> honestly had the most issue with. I kept putting my stem in facing the other direction and I'd have to take <laughs> seam. So if you haven't done this block a lot and you just don't have all that memorized, having a picture is a really great way um, to go about that piece. Now, once you have all the the little columns together, so that's what we have here. Then we have these pieces, right? Oops. And I turn. No, here we go. So here I've got. This is this section. Here's the middle, and here's this one. So I can make sure that again I have it lined up right. And sure enough, if you do it right, it looks like a leaf, right? <laughs> Which is nice. You know, I love the idea of having that next to it because that's the problem I always have is that. And they look so beautiful when you're finished. But if you, like you said, if you put that little stem on the wrong way, it's not going to look so good. <laughs> well, you call it something else, maybe like a half flower or something. I don't know. Or maybe it'd be abstract art, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Certainly isn't what you're going for. So then when you get here, now I will tell you when you go to join here, it is important to make sure that as you're pinning, you're lining up the seams because you do want it to kind of match up as you're going. So you'll lay these two together. Again, stitching with a quarter inch seam. And another tip is when you want to be uh, ironing, your seam allowances in opposite directions so it'll lay flat. So the middle piece, you see I've ironed it up. This other piece that's next door, the, the other two are ironed with the seam allowances going down. And the reason that we do that is because when we join them here, 
and we sew it together, we want these two seam allowances facing in opposite directions. And that'll just give us a much flatter seam when we sew it. So really easy construction. And so in just a few minutes, you've got a beautiful block just like that. I love that. It's so cute. Everybody's saying great tip, great tip. And they love watching this. Oh, Darlene loves watching it on YouTube. Even better. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. So then once you get the blocks in, your next opportunity is, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can arrange the maple leaf blocks. It's a really fun block to work with. So spend a few minutes once you have all of your blocks made and kind of play around with whatever layout you want. I think I ended up doing mine I'll have to look. I'll pull it up in a minute. But I would spend that extra couple minutes here playing with your layout before you start stitching them together because it's faster to change your mind at this point than after you have them all sewn together. And then once that happens, then we have the little quilt top. So here it is all together. Isn't that cute? So this is just a different color way. And again, you can make these in whatever color uh, works you know, in your color scheme. But I thought these were great. This is about the color the leaves are beginning to change where I live. So it was just a nice, a nice way to that, do it. That's really beautiful. Yeah, it's really pretty. And so on the back, remember the pressing? Because we've, we've basically pressed everything in opposite directions. It really, even though there's a ton of little seams in here, it lays pretty flat. So it's easy uh, to work with. All right. So um, do we have any, any questions or any from the audience, Angela? Everybody's just saying they love it. They can't wait to try their rotary blade. Some people have ordered the rotary blade and they're waiting for it to be back in stock, but everybody's absolutely loving it. I saw um, someone just asked, did you say you use starch on your um, fabric? Is that how you thickened it? Yeah. I know it's probably not a brother brand, so we can't say that, but they were just asking in general. Yeah, and I actually, because this one has so many of the pieces that you're sewing across the bias where fabric tends to stretch, I starched it pretty heavily, almost till it was lightly damp, I would say, and then I ironed it dry. And so it came, it comes off the mat really easy on the scanning cut. You don't have any distortion of the pieces when they're cutting. And then when you're at the sewing machine, you don't have any stretch. You don't have wonky pieces. Perfect. Thank you. Uh -huh. No problem. All right, so once you have... The quilt wasn't that the quickest, easiest quilt ever. So now he is. He is. <laughs> it's time to decorate it. So I'm going to show you. This is this is my sad inspiration picture for my moose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, in case you didn't know this about me, I am not an artist, right? And so I was sitting there trying to figure out, well, how am I going to make it bigger, and how am I going to get all the sizes? And this was, a, this was a time where it's really awesome to have a daughter who's a kindergarten teacher because she's like, uh, Mom, all <laughs> I have is circles and ovals. Aside from the antlers, you probably have all those shapes on the scan cut. And you know what? She was, <laughs> she was correct. So here, basically, so once I played with it, I basically put, I'm kind of a nerd, so I, I basically laid out, I went on the machine, figured out, you know, what shapes I was going to need. I played around with the sizes and I cut them out in paper until I had it about the right size for me. And so, you know, the antlers, I'm going to show you the antlers. And I ended up this piece I call the hair. You might call it the eyebrow. Again, I'm not an artist, so forgive, forgive me here. But I put the part of the animal, right? If it's a shape that was on the machine, here's the shape on the machine. These are the sizes I decided I would cut it at, how many I needed. And I just basically sorted it by the, the the color density of the fabric, right? So that's that's the way I work. So my two pieces that I had to do with scan to direct cut would be this one. Some might say that looks like a W, and they wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> and the other one is my little antlers. So here's my here's my drawing of the antlers. So let me show you how you can take pictures like this, um, hold on one second while I reset the scan and cut, and you can actually convert those into a cut file. And it's not only for something like this, I'll take this off so the glare is not blinding you here, not for, not just for things like this. This could be, you know, like grandchild's artwork that you're trying to turn into a cut file, or it could be like, I have lots of fusible applique patterns from, um, a while ago when they didn't used to give you the cut files. So you can print out those PDFs, put them on the mat, scan them into the machine and turn those into cut files too. All right. 
So we're going to pop over to the scan and cut screen now and we'll do this. Now, note, I don't know if you noticed when I was over there, I had it on the teal mat, which is the low tack because I drew it on a piece of paper. So all I'm doing right now is I'm loading the mat into the machine. And as soon as it does that, all right. So I'm going to be using the scanning function. So I'm going to go to scan and then I want to scan to direct cut, right? I want to make a cut file out of it. And I'm going to do that directly on the scan and cut. I'm not going to use my computer at all. All right. So now it's telling me that, you know, it thinks it's a 12 by 12 inch mat and that's fine. We'll go ahead and do start. Um, if you need to move the scanner lever, I'm, I'll be fine with this, but if it'll tell you if you need to move it, I'm fine here. So it's going to basically pull the mat into the machine and it's basically now reading my little um, antler. It also, my daughter told me it looks more like a chicken leg than an antler, but you know, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but Edith says that moose is so cute. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So here you can see it's come into the machine. It's been scanned. That looks good. I'm going to hit OK. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the arrows and I'm going to crop tight around the image here just to get rid of all the, you know, I have the cut marks and junk on my mat and some other things here. So that looks pretty good. If, you know, maybe you had some speckles on the, on the paper, it was picking up something else. You can get rid of some of that by ignoring the object size. And then you just move this number up until all that little stuff just sort of disappears for you. Okay. Once you're done here, you'll hit okay. And it's going to process. And you can see here, it's turned my drawing into a cut file. So that was super quick and easy to do. Um, if now I just did mine as a feasible, I did not stitch the applique down because I wanted this to be kind of an easy peasy fun project. But if you were going to stitch it down and you were worried about um, the fabric being captured by the applique stitches, you can come in here at the offset tool and you can basically bump out your design a little bit. Typically for applique, if I'm doing it, it's between 0 0.04 and 0 0.06. And all that's going to do is make it just a wee bit bigger. And then you'll make sure that you have good capture when you cut it out. All right. So it's really simple to take these hand-drawn patterns or drawings and with a machine really quickly turn them into cut files. All right. And then all I would do here is I would do OK. And if I were ready to cut it, which right now I have my uh, paper on here, I would, I'll just take this mat out, I'll save this and put the fabric on the mat, run it through and cut it out. So really super easy to do. So the other thing, just in case on the other pieces, that if, if people haven't uh, played around with resizing, just really quick, for example, on his head, I said I went into an egg shape. So I'm coming in here to the just regular simple shapes that are in here. And I'm going to uh, tab down until I get to the one that looks like an egg. So here I have ovals, but I actually wanted it to be more egg shaped. So I'm just going to keep coming down here. All right, until I get to, I think I'm almost there. Ah, there's my egg shape right here, BAA098. So all I would do is pull up his head. And based on my playing with this, I decided I wanted eight eight and a quarter by five and a half inches. So I'm just gonna basically uh, come in here and do the plus sign until I get the width to where I want it five and a half. I have to slow myself down at the end. I like to speed past my target. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. <laughs> All right, now at this point, I don't want it to be any wider, but I want it to be taller. And so in order to do that, I'll come over here and that's basically going to turn off the aspect ratio. And then I can just increase the height of it without changing the width until I get it to that perfect size. And basically this process is just rinse and repeat, whoops, through all the remaining pieces until you get, see, I've raced past my target again. I can't talk and, and click at the same time. <laughs> That's all you'd have to do. And then you would set. And again, you'd, if you were cutting this out, you have lots of room left on your mat. So I could come back in here and add and come back in here and I could pick up one of the other shapes that I wanted. OK, so it's really simple to do this. Now, what I did for myself is I, I resized all the little parts here and then I saved. I organized them by color fabric. So you can see here. 
These are the cut files for the lighter fabric on the moose. So you've got his little snout and his ears, part of his eyes and that eyebrow or hair thing I talked about. Um, here's the antlers and all the dark pieces, his head, uh, the inside, his nostrils and the inside of his ears, that kind of stuff. And then up here, I saved the white pieces and those are primarily in the eye area on a separate mat. So then all I had to do was load the right fabric color in the mat. I could have actually put the white ones and the light colored ones on the same mat if I wanted to, but that way I was able to do, you know, lots of mooses and different really quickly without worrying about that. You, uh, you made the day for Carla. Carla says, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now she knows how to increase the size of that cut file. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. All right, so then, you know, once you're ready to cut, now on this one, because I was using a uh, fusible applique, sorry for that. It's a, little, it's a little noisy when you pull that cover sheet off. This time, <laughs> I my standard mat, so that's the one with the purple end here. I've got the iron-on fusible on the back of my fabric. Um, Brother makes a great one, the iron-on fabric applique uh, contact sheets that you can use for that. Um, you do want a, a, a really nice uh, fusible iron-on in the back. And then uh, once it's ironed on, you'll just lay the fabric onto the mat. And I use the standard auto blade. It's going to be this one, the, the gray and silver one. And then it just will go through and cut those pieces out really quickly. Again, removing them from the mat, you have two ways to do it. You can you can grab the fabric and pull it from the mat. My mat is really tacky right now, so I'm gonna do that trick I told you earlier where I'm just gonna basically uh, pull down the fabric and I'm gonna pull my mat away from my fabric more than the other way around. And it's gonna keep, it's gonna really help me to manage the curl of that fabric piece as I pull it off the mat, okay? I love that fabric. It looks, it actually looks kind of like a moon or something. It's really cool. Yeah, it is. It is kind of fun. It's got some, some natural movement to it. So once you get all the pieces cut out, then it's really fun. Then it's, then you get to be a kindergarten student yourself, right? So what I like to do when I'm doing these projects is I like to actually build my fusible. I'm going to ask my lovely assistant to take those off my hands. I actually build mine on parchment paper. So this is the same kind of parchment paper you can use in the in the kitchen to keep stuff from sticking to your hands. Um, and so what the reason I like to do this is it allows me to fuse the pieces together without having to commit to exactly where I want them on the fabric yet. So I play around with things until I get them right. And the other thing that's really nice about it is I'm gonna bring up the little quilt top again. And I can actually see through the parchment paper to the quilt, right? So if I'm trying to work around, this, maybe I want this to line up right with the top of that block or whatever, I can actually see through the parchment paper to the quilt block that's underneath, you know, and I did a lot of playing around with the antlers. I, I had a lot of freedom with his ears and his, and his uh, face and all, but I couldn't get his antlers out too wide or they wouldn't fit on the project. And then it, you'd be amazed at how expressive a moose can be based on where his ears and his antlers end up. <laughs> so just another tip. But then once I have them all fused together, right, I can lift him off the parchment paper as a single unit. Let's see if I can get him up a little bit higher. And then I can do my final placement for exactly where I want him on my piece. And then basically I just take him to my uh, pressing station and I... Uh, I normally put a pressing cloth on top and I just give him a nice press all over uh, to make sure that he's adhered really well to the fabric. Tina, I have to tell you, that moose is so <laughs> stinking cute. I'm just like, I love it. It went from that itsy bitsy sketch to this. I mean, it's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. I don't know. Did, would you ever thought that little picture would turn into that? <laughs> <laughs> it is so cute. <laughs> I love his little, I initially wanted that to be like a little hair tuft, but it kind of looks like his, his eyebrows. So I think he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, I love it. Everybody's saying, I love it. I love it. Just a quick question for you though. Carol wanted to know, um, how often can you use that mat and when do you need to replace it or a mat? How often do you use a mat? 
Um, so I use my mats for a really, really long time. Um, the thing that you need to do is periodically you have to clean them. And especially when you're cutting fabric, because fabric is linty and the lint sort of gets all over the adhesive. Um, yeah. And then your mat doesn't seem like it has a tack anymore. And it seems like you need to get a new mat. Don't get a new mat initially. Go ahead and clean it first. And what I use is a uh, just a spray cleaning solution. It's I'm not sure what's in it. It clearly has some ammonia in it based on the smell. And by the way, don't spray that on your foot because it hurts. <laughs> and then let it sit for a few seconds and take the scraper tool that you can get in the toolkit and scrape off all the little bits of fabric and the lint and all that. You may have accumulated adhesive and all kinds of stuff. And then wipe it clean with a paper towel, which sounds crazy, but while it's wet, the lint from the paper towel won't stick. And then let it um, sit in a warm area for just probably five minutes or so till it dries. And then the tack will be right back to where it was before. That's a great tip. That's always, I think the biggest question, everyone's like, I don't know how to clean my mat. It's not sticky anymore. And you, what well, you said is exactly right. You don't necessarily have to get a new mat. Clean it the right way and all of a sudden it's sticky again. It's like magic. <laughs> It really is. I mean, like I, I could cut, you know, the fabric on the fabric mat, probably three or four mats full of fabric. And then it would, you could tell it really didn't have a lot of tack in it because of the lint and the fabric. And then I would clean it and then it was good to do, you know, four or five more fabrics full of cutting. So definitely clean it before you replace it because these mats really last for a long time. That's awesome. Everybody's saying they love the moose. <laughs> All right. So, you know, you got to have a saying if you're going to do this. And so um, adding the message, there's there's so many cute sayings for fall, right? There's, you know, I think I put happy fall. I've got another one that I have cut out, autumn blessings. I did, I did another one that I got kind of carried away. I think I did autumn leaves and pumpkins, please. So, you know, find your favorite sentiment for the fall. And then for the lettering, you have a couple of options. Um, one of the options is you could cut the letters out of fabric, just like we did the moose, right? And so in that case, um, and let's actually pop over the screen on the scan and cut and walk through a couple of these. Of course, I lost my stylus, but that's what I love. Oh, there we go. All right. So um, at the machine, you've got lots of lettering that's already on the machine, again, in the pattern area. And so here's where you go for your lettering. And you've got lots of really pretty choices in here. You've got block and, and non-block, but all kinds of cool fonts. So find the one that speaks to you and then um, just type out your message. So, you know, maybe I want to put something like um, happy fall. I think that's what I put on the first one. So I would just literally type out my message. All right. There's my first. I would go ahead and resize it. Again, mine's 12 inches across, so I would probably increase the size and on the lettering you're looking down here for the dimensions i probably don't want mine to go much more than about here right and then i would come in and add the second one the same kind of way now if you're doing fabric just so we're all clear it's going to cut out each one of the letters separately you're going to have that fusible on the back and then you're going to have to place them by hand right and that's not really hard but you know if you're a person who really is a perfectionist just understand that it's going to take you a little bit more time to do that. The other option that you have is also in the patterns, you have full words right in here. And these are great for fabric because the words are welded together. So instead of like smile being five pieces, it's just one. Piece. So we could pop in here. And you know, if we go to the Bon Voyage, here's autumn, right? So that was easy. Same kind of thing here. I might make this a little bit bigger if I wanted to um, and set it. And then uh, come in here and add. And in that same area, there's another, there's blessings is in here. Let's see if I can find it real quick. But you got all kinds of fun things themed to different holidays, um, sports kinds of things, all kinds of options. So here's blessings. That's nice. And it's really trendy right now to mix font types. So, you know, you've got two different script fonts here. So that's really pretty. So if I were doing fabric, I would probably... Um, do one of these that's welded together or, you know, uh, you can, you can come up here and you can take the individual letters and manipulate them in the software or weld those together. So that's one way that you can do the lettering. The other way you can do it, and I'm just going to come back out of here, is I actually decided that I wanted to use heat transfer vinyl. So that's a, a vinyl uh, product. It's got what they call a carrier sheet on it. 
and then the, the vinyl that you attach. So here, I'm going to pop over to this camera really quick. So here, here is the, the um, autumn blessings that I cut out of that heat transfer vinyl. The, what I call the carrier sheet is the shiny part on top. It's like a giant, oops, I'm trying to not blind you with a glare. It's like a giant piece of scotch tape, I guess, right? And the vinyl is sticking to that. When you are doing um, the heat transfer vinyl though, you put the material on the mat like this. And so at the machine, let's pop it here really quick, make sure that you, you know how to do this. So let's say I was doing the autumn this way on the heat transfer vinyl. There would be one additional edit I'd have to make here because again, I'm cutting it upside down. I have to go in and edit. I go to object edit and then I'm going to mirror it. So that's the two arrows that point together and see how it reverses it. So that's how it cuts at the machine. And then we'll come back over to this camera here. And then when it's done cutting, I pull this off the mat and then I peel away all that excess vinyl, leaving my sentiment behind, all right? So if I were doing individual letters that weren't welded, I normally do mine in heat transfer vinyl because it's just quicker and easier for me to do. And then I decide where I would want that in relation to my mousse. Now, the, the, the other thing about this carrier sheet is it's made to, to be pressed, right? So it can handle the heat of a heat press or the heat of an iron. So you would just basically move it where you wanted it to be and then affix it. Normally it's medium to high heat for 20 to 30 seconds for this type of material. And then depending on the kind, some of them you wait till it's cool to peel away this top layer and others um, you can peel away that excess layer when it's hot. And so if we go back to our original uh, mousse that we started with, here you can see I've done the happy fall. This is in that same heat transfer vinyl. And there are some really fun products out there. This one is actually, they call it Flock. So as I feel it, it feels like velvet. It's got some texture to it and it's almost furry. So it's kind of a fun product to work with. So two different ways that you can uh, do your lettering on the project. I love that. It's it, it looks, I love the colors on that. Yeah, I really, I, I wasn't sure with the green leaves. I did it in green and my husband said, well, green's not very fall. <laughs> so <laughs> We did it in, in the oranges, and he's right. It really is cute in this colorway too. So I mean, I I just think you kind of match it to whatever you whatever you're trying to to match it to, and and go with it. So then once we get our lettering and our mousse ironed down, right now we're ready to come over to the embroidery machine, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly move over there. I dropped a bunch of stuff on the floor, so I had to cl clean that up really quickly. So oh, that's great. Now we know it's live. That you got to drop something, trip over something. Or <laughs> weren't we just talking about that? <laughs> so I'm going to actually um, do some embroidery on here. So really quickly, I'm just going to change out my embroidery foot. I'm going to out. I'm going to go back to the home setting. If you're not familiar with this, all right. And I'm going to come out of sewing and into embroidery. And so it's just letting me know that the carriage is going to return. I'm, I've, I've taken off my sewing presser foot. Now I'm just going to put on my embroidery presser foot. So that's pretty easy. Um, the one thing I would always recommend when you're changing presser feet, uh, always use the little screwdriver to tighten them up. You think you got them tight by hand, but they're just not quite tight enough. So I would always use the screwdriver when I'm doing that. So the technique that we're going to use on the mousse is edge to edge quilting. And so that's going to be a design that will repeat several times across the project and it, all of them will connect seamlessly together. So it'll, it'll look like it was done on a long arm machine. And so um, in terms of hooping, you'll notice, I'm going to pop out to the other camera that, yep. Yeah. So here I've got my quilt sashing frame. I've added batting behind it and I have a backing fabric in here. I've got my little mousse guy in here ready to go. I've already done a couple repeats because this edge to edge, the joining the patterns perfectly is really kind of the trick or the secret sauce. So I want to spend a couple minutes going over that. Okay. So I'm just going to set the hoop on the machine really quickly and then we'll work on the design. 
All right, so in case you didn't know, um, you've got some really cute edge to edge designs on the Luminaire. Um, they're gonna come in here to category one and then we're gonna come all the way over to category 15. So if you have the Luminaire two or you do the upgrade to the Luminaire one, you have this category in here. And then all the way at the end of this category, you've got two really cute continuous or edge to edge quilting designs. And you'll notice for both of them, my fingers are kind of big here, but you'll notice they start and they end here and here. And that's what we're going to connect as we go across a bigger project. So I've used the sewing one on so many of my projects. I love it. Today, I'm going to use the feathering one because we're doing something that's more nature. So I'm going to pick design number 49 here with my finger because it doesn't like my stylus. So here's my design. I'll go ahead and set it. Now, you'll see it comes in really big, right? It's almost 15 inches tall and it's almost 10 inches wide. And my quilt sashing frame is seven by 14. So the first thing I'm gonna need to do is resize this guy. So I'm gonna come into edit and I'm gonna go to size. And I want it to end up a little bit less than seven inches wide and a little bit less than 12 inches tall. And so that's probably more than 20%. So I'm going to choose the resizing with stitch recalculation option here. And what that does is as I make it smaller, it's going to reduce the stitches so it doesn't get really um, thick on me. If I were making it bigger, it would add stitches. So it's just as beautiful at, at whatever size I pick. So I'm going to go to stitch, resize with stitch recalculation. I don't know why I keep trying to use my scan and cut stylus on this machine. <laughs> So now I'm going to start with proportionally de decreasing it. And again, I'm looking at right around 6.89 inches is my goal. So I'll just keep pushing in here till I get to that. All right. So that's the width I wanted. I can make it a little bit taller. It'll fit in my hoops. I'm just going to come in here and pop that up till it's almost 12 inches. All right. So that's a great size for me. It'll fit in my hoop really nicely. So I'm ready to go at this point. So I'm resized and, and ready here. So I'll hit the OK screen. And I'm also going to come into embroidery. So what we're going to use to match this up so we're kind of faking that look of a long arm is we're going to use the projector. So that's on the embroidery side. So once we pop in here, here's I'll turn the projector on. And then we'll, we'll look over here. And hopefully you guys can see this. I play around, around with the lighting. So, check. all right, so where I ended the last pattern, I went ahead and drew a little circle around it with a heat erasable pen because I know it'd be hard to see in the lighting here. So that's where this new pattern needs to, to match. And so here it's shining my pattern. So at the screen, which I think my head's in the way here. Yeah. So I'm going to take the, the window here and I'm going to move it over so it's focused on this join area. And then here in my hoop, this is where I need it to be to match that exactly. And this is where it is. So I'm going to take my move buttons and I'm just going to start sliding that pattern down. I got a little bit further to go here. Almost there. I told you I like to overshoot my target. So I'm trying, I'm trying not to do it. All right, so it looks it looks really good here. And what I do is, so this is showing that the first stitch is right on top of the last one. So it's right on top. And I normally scooch it in one stitch, so I have a good match there. So now that part looks good. So now what I want to do is I'm going to basically check across the top and the bottom and down the side, okay? So as I move this up, what I'm looking for is to make sure, so here's the new stitch, here's my last stitch. I don't want those to overlap, so I don't have anything overlapping. That looks great. At the top here, I want to make sure that I'm not, you know, crazy going off the top of my fabric or anything, so that all looks good. And so now I'm going to come down here and check this side. Same kind of thing. I don't want the new stitches to lay down right on top of stitches I've already done. If I had that happen, I might have to rotate my pattern, but this actually looks really good and again across the bottom it looks like it's going to be perfect all right so once you have that done we'll hit the ok button here now if you're still a little bit gun shy if you haven't really done this before the other thing that you can do as kind of a final fail safe stitch is before you hit the green button and go to go you can come down here and you can move your stitch count 
one stitch forward, okay? And then if you want to, you can hand wheel the machine and you can lower the needle and, and sure enough, it's right on top of that last stitch exactly where I wanted it to be. So that's perfect. And so at that point, I just, I would be ready to go ahead and stitch it out. All right, so I'll let it get started and then I'll, yeah. That's kind of noisy, but that's all you have to do um, to use those edge edge to edge quilting patterns. My face is a little bit big for me there um, and have perfect match. I love that. Everybody's just, go I, I'm watching all the wows. They're like, wow. So it automatically recalculated for you. Someone just, uh, they're just, they can't believe this. And I love how you can show on the screen where the pattern was related to how it shows up on the fabric. That's a great way to see that. Uh, you do have a few questions for you though. Uh, Beth wanted to know, and this is a great question because some people think it's a big deal to change between sewing and embroidery. When you change from sewing and embroidery, did you have to change the plate or what happened there? No, all I did was I loosened the screw and I took the sewing uh, presser foot off and put the embroidery foot on and I was, that's all I had to do. Awesome. Everybody's saying this is great. So I don't know, um, Jane wants to know, is this how I would do it on the 10 needle too? Very similar? Yes, on the 10 needle, um, you, you don't have the positioning or the projector rather, you'd use the real time positioning camera that's on the machine to do that same kind of matching. Awesome. Everybody's saying thank you, thank you. It is a great machine. <laughs> And it really is. One more. Someone had asked earlier, and I don't know where it went. Um, you know, the letters that you put down, they were asking, did you stitch those letters on then, or do you just rely on the quilting then to keep that in place? Well, remember, if, if I did them with fabric, they would have had the iron-on fusible on the back, so that would secure them. And then the quilt stitches are a little extra security and really a decorative element. If they're heat transfer mm -hmm. vinyl, same thing. They already have a heat activated adhesive on the back, so once you fuse it, they're permanent. Okay, so Marcia says you can stitch right over that then if you were using vinyl? Yep, you sure can. There you go, Marcia. Very easy to do. Everybody's saying thank you, thank you, great project. Everyone's saying I've learned so much. I agree. <laughs> awesome, well, you know, um, because we're creative people, I wanted to show you guys another quick alternative just in case you're not a moose person. All right, but it sounds like we've got lots of moose people today. <laughs> well, even if they weren't a moose person, they are now. That thing is so cute. <laughs> so here's another example, a different colorway. So again, these leaves look great in all the colors, don't they? Super oh my cute. gosh, I, that looks totally different. I know, isn't that amazing? And it's really pretty simple. So here, you know, stacked pumpkins are super popular right now. So we did some pumpkins here. And again, this is the, the longer saying, and again, um, experiment a little bit. You know, this mixing and matching of font types is really popular right now. This is, again, another kind of heat transfer vinyl. Um, this one has a matte finish. So honestly, once you press it, it, all, it really looks like it was printed directly on the fabric, doesn't it? Oh, it really does. Actually, I'm, I'm looking really close, Quinn. I cannot believe that. That looks awesome. Yeah. And the quilt stitch, you know, and at home, you know, some of you might not like the white thread on, on the quilt blocks. I, I had to use a little bit of a contrasting thread so that you can actually see the quilt stitches, but you could use, you know, invisible thread if you just want texture and don't want colors, or you could pick up one of the colors in your project and do the quilting stitches with that color as well. Um, but I did want to show you really quick, and I already told you I'm kind of a nerd. So just in case you we're trying to figure out pumpkins, right? So I'm gonna show you a couple of things on the scanning cut. So there are several uh, pumpkins that are on the machine itself, but a lot of them have a very specific Halloween flair, right? They've got the jack-o'-lantern with the eyes and the mouth and that kind of stuff cut out. And that wasn't really what I was looking for in this project. So again, my kindergarten teacher daughter says, uh, you know, mom, a pumpkin is just a bunch of ovals laid on top of each other, right? Who knew? <laughs> So you can actually come in here. I'm just showing you the oval shape. It's it's um, figure B A A O six six. So if we're being super precise, you can do five or seven pieces. The one in the center is the biggest, and you're going to taper out. The next two are going to be the same size, but make them a little bit smaller, say a quarter of an inch smaller. And the next one, again, these next two are the same size, but they're about a quarter inch smaller than the one before, and then the same thing going out. And by the way, the stem shape is in the machine as well. 
And so really quick, in case you haven't built a pumpkin, this is basically, these are paper, so it's it'll be quick for us to, to build it out here. So here's all my little oval parts, right? So here's my center, and this is my neck size. And so I would just slide it. If you're, if you're having separate pieces of fabric, you would basically slide it in this way. I'll show you on the machine another option for you. So that's how you do half of the pumpkin. And then you basically slide in the pieces on the other side, whoops, and do the same thing. And then you would just, once you were happy with it, you would fuse it in here and here's the little stem. We'll slide that baby in there too. And look how easy it is to make a pumpkin. Like really, who knew? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love that. I, I, everybody's like, what would you do without your daughter? Can we run your daughter? <laughs> That's amazing. And that was so simple. I'm looking at those ovals going, how are those going to go together? And there you go. Yeah, it's just, it's really simple. Now, I'm going to come back to the screen on the scanning cut really quick. Um, this, the way I showed you with the paper pieces would be if you wanted to alternate, like on the little pumpkin, um, I alternated prints and solids, right? But if you wanted to cut out a single piece, I've basically already done the ovals here. So I'm just gonna retrieve them from the machine here. So here's all the little pieces right now at the machine. I just dragged them in and sort of bunched them all together. It looks like a hot mess right now. I, I get that. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in and we're gonna, um, we're gonna do some editing. So the first thing I do on edit is I wanna select everything that I have on the screen. So that's group select. So I, this is my choice. I want everything on there. So I've got a box around all those little pieces. So once I have that, I come into object edit and I'm going to weld it, which means I'm going to take all those pieces and make them one thing. So that's this icon right here. And it's going to take a minute and it's just telling me once I do this, Tina, you can't change your mind and undo it. Are you okay? I am. So I'm going to hit okay. It's going to take a couple seconds here. Now, I don't know if you remember, but on my little pumpkin piece, I had a little black shadow behind the pumpkins. So the way that you would do that, this is what I would cut out in the orange. And remember earlier we did the offset in case we were stitching the applique. So if I wanted to cut out that black shadow piece, I would use that same offset option. This time I bumped it out to about a third of an inch. So be kind of generous with it here. And you can play around. And again, you can always cut these things out with paper and play around with it until you're happy with it. And then you would cut the bigger pumpkin out in black and the smaller one in orange. And when you lay them on top of each other, and let me show you again with the little pumpkin banner, you would have that kind of shadow effect behind it. Oh, I love that. That really explained that well. Someone just asked, though, um, just out of curiosity, Tina, when you have all those ovals, do you cut... Like after you layer them, do you cut behind to take off the excess fabric or do you just keep building? I didn't. I built it on top of each other and I did it to see if it would be too bulky, but it really doesn't have. Now, these were thin. This was a thin uh, cotton that I used for it, but no, it doesn't have a lot of bulk. It's not hard or stiff. It, you know, it has a lot of uh, flexibility in it. But if you did have that concern, you could go in there and um, and cut out the areas behind it. It almost gives it a 3D effect, leaving it all together like that. I like that. Yeah, it really, it creates some kind of shadow and depth to it. It's kind of a fun little trompe l'oeil effect. <laughs> You're going to have to read all these comments. Uh, everybody's like, I, <laughs> Mary, Mary Lou says, I need to go back to kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I may try and make something complicated, my daughter Danny says, Mom, you know, it's just a circle and a square. <laughs> That's going to be my new lingo. <laughs> Everybody's saying awesome, awesome. Yeah, I like the paper too, Barbara says. Gosh, you don't even have any questions. You explained it so well. Everybody's saying thank you, thank you. I think there was one I missed. Um, no. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Excellent. Oh, Tina, this is a great. Could you just show that pumpkin one one more time, though? Just for somebody who wants to just stare at it for a second because then they go back and, and work on that. I'm going to bring this up just by itself. Actually, I wonder if we did the other camera and I held it at a distance if they could see. Oops, I got to get the side. I got to think backwards here. So here it is. We're all big. Yeah, I love that. Everybody, really, I'm not very coordinated at doing this. Can you tell? <laughs> I love this. And everybody's saying, you know, there's so many great things in this. A great lesson. Yes, absolutely. But the other thing is, 
it's great to see all these different options in the scan and cut because I'm reading the comments for everyone. I get the best part of the job reading what they're saying. And they're saying, I have the scan and cut. I didn't realize that was in there. The other thing is with the Luminaire, a lot of people don't realize a lot of the things with the fills. So this was such a great lesson. It showed so much. And if you don't have the Luminaire, you can still do this project. It just might be a little different. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're really good resources. And, you know, really start to finish on this project after I got the pattern. I will say I spent a little bit of time, time on that. But the actual construction, the whole thing was like two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. It's pretty quick to come together. That's not bad. I love that. I, my, still, my favorite part is how you had planned for something smaller and it just kept growing. I could see how putting those a little quick blocks together it's kind of addictive it's kind of fun <laughs> it really is really fun and then you start turning them all around and you're like oh my gosh i have so many choices how do i pick <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So for those of you that rolled in late that maybe missed the beginning, don't forget if you're on Facebook, share this to your page. You can go back and find it quite easily that way. And if you're on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to Brother So's page. And also there are over 200 of these live videos that you can go back and binge watch from last year. If you're new to the party, if you're old to the party, you can go back and watch those as well. Everybody's saying thank you. And you can still ask questions later on because the Brother team's always watching. Uh, Anne had a quick question. Were the letters vinyl or fabric on the last one? They were vinyl. It's a, it's a HTV, they call it matte. So it has a matte finish, which means there's no shine. A lot of the, let me try and get my coordination here. A lot of the heat transfer vinyls have a shiny finish, but if you can get one with a matte finish, once you press it, you can't feel it. There's no texture to it. And because it doesn't have any shine to it, it really looks like it was printed directly on the fabric. It's pretty awesome. It really looks like it was printed. Even when you held it up earlier, I was looking at that going, wow, that's awesome. Mary says, guess what I'm making today? <laughs> well, good news, Mary. As soon as we're finished live in about two minutes, you can go back and watch this step by step again and put it, the, put it on your tablet or something and follow along right next to your scan and cut in your machine. Oh, Tina, this is a fantastic project. I love it. Well, see, now you can get out your sweater and make yourself a fall theme wall hang and it's all good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, everyone, thank you for joining us, Tina. This was an excellent project. I'm just going to bring this up real quick for you. For those of you that, uh, uh, first of all, the rotary blade, I know some of you have been looking for, call your local brother dealer. If you go to brothersos.com, which I have down below here, uh, you can find your local dealer by putting in your zip code and call them. And I know some of them are putting it on order if they don't have it. So put your name in there so you don't miss the first batch coming in. And uh, it works on any DX models. Is that correct? That's correct. I always want to make sure. <laughs> I, I hear so much different information coming in. I want to make sure I got the right thing. Uh, Shirley wants to know, did you use the rotary blade for your letters? But no, that was, oh, well, I guess I shouldn't answer that. I don't know if you did or not. I actually cut some of them out with a rotary blade and some of them out with the auto blade because I wanted to see, you know, how everything worked and it turned out great with both. So you've got options. There you go. And if you want to see more about the rotary blade cutting felt, you can watch last uh, Tuesday's show because that was pretty good with Cindy as well. There's a lot of demonstrations on here. So that's the brother sews. And also there's a new blog. There are new blogs on there for the sewing and crafting side. And I think make sure I have everything else up here. If I'm missing anything. <laughs> it's the end of the week. Are we forgetting anything? I don't think so. But I do know that Brother loves to see what you're working on. Be sure to tag them. And I'll put the Instagram up here. Tag them. We all love to see what you're working on. And quite often, if you've been noticing, Brother's been sharing your work. So uh, I cannot wait to see this one. This is going to be, that moose is my favorite, Tina, I got to say. <laughs> I'm partial to the moose as well. <laughs> I agree. It was so cute. Uh, what is the video called? So this one that you'll look for, Mardine, is um, this is episode 205, if you want to save this one for later. And the one from Tuesday was 204. I, I started numbering numbering them, but it was like after we had already had about 50 of them. So the first 50, I don't know, it's, what did you call it? A hot mess. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, Tina, thank you so much, everyone. We can't wait to see your work. Uh, thank you for spending an hour with us, brother. Thank you for letting us take over your page. And we will see you again next week, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday at 2. Sounds perfect. Tina, have a wonderful day. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Upsize your creativity with the all-new, all-smart Innovus NQ1700E, only from your friends at Brother. Demo one at your brother.